Welcome to 2020 Philosophers, a series dedicated to the renewal of philosophical practices in the 21st century. Today, our guest is Yves Citon. He is currently professor of French literature and media studies at the University of Paris 8. He is familiar uh, with the American universities since he taught at the University of Pittsburgh and he has been a visiting professor here at New York University and at Harvard too in 2011. Yves is from Switzerland, so he's one of our Francophone thinkers, but let me say that all of uh, our guests are Francophone, whether they are French or from another country. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, Yves considers himself as a philosopher, but he's fully involved in the philosophical debates today and he develops a real philosophical reflection and practice. One of his first books was devoted to Spinoza, L'envers de la liberté, l'invention d'un imaginaire spinoziste dans la France des Lumières in 2006. But much more than a historian of philosophy, Yves is an inventor of concepts and he moves with amazing ease in several disciplinary fields, anthropology, literature, politics, media. Among his numerous books, he wrote Lire, Interpréter, Actualiser, Pourquoi les études littéraires in 2007, Mythocracy, 2010, Gestes d'humanité, Anthropologie sauvage de nos expériences esthétiques, 2012, and uh, uh, translated in English, The Ecology of Attention, published by Cambridge Press in 2016, and Mediarchy, also uh, in Cambridge Press, Cambridge, Cambridge Press in 2019. Eve's inventiveness is also nourished by a dialogue with the living authors. He's an incredible reader and uh, keeps up to date with everything that is published in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, he's a, a thinker engaged in contemporary political and social issues and the co-editor of Multitude, a leftist journal that publishes uh, four, four issues a year. Today, Eve will talk about, uh, I thought that we would talk about his uh, most recent book published by Le Seuil, uh, Génération Collapsonautes uh, Navigué par Temps d'Effondrement, that he has written with uh, Jacopo Rasmi. But he just, he just told me that uh, he's uh, currently uh, writing uh, the next book. So uh, <laughs> that's the premiere. We, we will uh, learn something about this uh, new project. So um, you will be able to ask questions at the end of his speech through the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen. So now, Yves, welcome to La Maison Française. Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you very much to the Maison Française to invite me in this uh, prestigious series. I was, as you said, I don't fully consider myself as a philosopher, so I was very uh, flattered to be part of such a distinguished series of, of uh, a philosopher. Um, uh, as you said, uh, I published in the spring uh, a book about collapse and the book uh, was released in the bookstores uh, about five or six days before the collapsing of the bookstores in France due to the lockdown. So that was a little bit ironical. Uh, it was uh, an attempt with my friend Jacopo Razmi, who is much younger than me. I'm close to 60 years old. He was close to 30 years old. And we thought we would look at the imaginary of collapse from a different perspective, different generational perspective and not criticize collapsology, this uh, science or this discourse uh, warning us about the possibility or the probability of a future collapsing of our modes of living. But to put it into perspective, we both of us think that there is something deeply true in this sort of collapse horizon, uh, collapsing horizon or horizon of collapse. Um, but uh, so we didn't want to criticize just to denounce it as an illusion. And yet we thought that certain things needed to be reflected upon. So we proposed a number of perspectives on this uh, imaginary of collapse. And what I'd like to do now is uh, sort of a continuation uh, of this. Um, and if there was some sort of a title or something that I will address uh, 
in these uh, 30 minutes that are uh, ahead of us. Maybe I would call it facing the breaks. Facing the breaks, uh, breaks as one thing breaking, breaking, falling apart. And how can we face this collapse or a series of things uh, breaking down? So when I think of, of breaks, I think of rupture or we have to, to change radically the way we live and the way we consume and the way we produce and the way we uh, rule our societies. Uh, but also the break, uh, I, I um, use this word thinking that uh, certain things are breaking apart in our societies and that I feel that conflicts are rising. Maybe that's not very original, but I see a lot of reasons why uh, with other people, why um, what are currently conflicts that can be sort of either pushed under the, the carpet or contained uh, are likely to be much less easily uh, contained in the future. And so this uh, attempt uh, that I will sketch uh, just today is to find different ways to, uh, again, contain conflictuality, not deny it, not just think that uh, uh, everything will be fine, we can just negotiate and find peace and so forth, uh, but not um, accept the fatality of something like a war or conflict degenerating into uh, wars. Now, you may be aware of the fact that in France with the, the event of the murder of a history teacher last week, uh, now all of France is thinking very heavily about uh, what a French president calls separatism uh, instead of talking about jihadism or um, Islamism, uh, the, his, or communitarianism, uh, which were the words, uh, French president talks about separatism, separation. And when I talk about breaks, it's, it is this. I think uh, I don't at all agree with his talk about separatism. We can talk about it later, maybe uh, if you want, Francois. But I think the, the intuition that something is breaking and we have to break from our past the past of colonization, the past of extractivism, and this may imply something breaking inside of our societies. And the attempt that I will um, develop now is to make these conflicts of these breaks as little uh, self-destructive, as little uh, warlike uh, as uh, possible. So how can we uh, face these breaks with less damage, less self-destruction? How can we prevent them degenerating into wars? How can we circumscribe our enemies? Uh, and the notion of enemy, uh, when you think of conflict, you think, oh, conflict is with uh, enemies. And this notion of enemy is interesting me uh, very much now. How can we maybe think of conflict without thinking of enemies? And I will give you three uh, suggestions uh, in order to do so. I'm going to tell you now what are the headings of this, uh, these suggestions. They will be probably quite uh, enigmatic because these are strange words and strange uh, phrases that I will use. But hopefully I can take them one by one and hopefully make some sense that we can discuss uh, earlier. So the first one, I will call it a diplomacy of interspecies interdependencies. And if you are familiar with some uh, current French philosophers, you may have recognized Baptiste Morisot. Baptiste Morisot is a young philosopher that I really, really appreciate and admire. And he developed this idea of diplomacy and interspecies dependencies. I'll go over that in a minute. The second um, type of uh, direction or the second suggestion or the second type of inquiries that I will um, address is, I could call it a tactics of coalition tactics of coalition. And here, my uh, reference point in terms of theory will be a Canadian philosopher that you may be familiar with or not called Erin Manning. Erin Manning published a, a series of fantastic books uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. One of them is called The Minor Gesture, which I really recommend. And I will uh, explicitly or not refer to Erin Manning's uh, thinking in this second part. And the third part, uh, I will call it a wizardry, just like a wizard, wizard of us, a wizardry of virality, like viruses. So we talk a lot about viruses today, and I think um, talk we have about viruses are quite uh, interesting and maybe quite naive. So I will try to work around a wizardry of virality. And here there will be different thinkers that I will uh, address later. Okay, and these three, um, again, inquiries, suggestions, directions, 
again, are meant to uh, equip us with uh, ways to uh, be inside of conflict, to face breaks, to face conflict, hopefully without degenerating into wars. So let me start with the first one. Um, again, uh, I, I will call it, following Baptiste Morizot, a diplomacy of interspecies interdependencies. Uh, Baptiste de Morizot published a fantastic book. I mean, he published a number of fantastic books, but the one I think that made him famous first uh, was called The Diplomat, Les Diplomates. And it was not about uh, China and Japan avoiding wars. It was uh, about wolves, the animals, wolves that had been reintroduced in certain parts of Europe and in France, and the problem that these wolves create with sheep with shepherd with uh, animals that the wolves tend to uh, eat or uh, kill sometimes they kill them without even eating them which is even more annoying if i may say so uh, if you think of wolves and sheep sheeps sheep whatever um, you have a good intuitive categorization of enemies say, oh the, the, the wolf is the enemy of the sheep and that's quite uh, that's quite likely to be so or if you bring this to the human uh, level, you have ecologists which are uh, eager to reintroduce wolves in a um, mountainous part of France, which are the enemies of the shepherds who uh, denounce the presence of these wolves because the, the wolves do something which is very, not just disturbing their business model, but just that really uh, hurts them and makes them terribly sad to have the animals that they care for being just killed and slaughtered uh, sometimes by wolves. So here again, ecologists and shepherds, it's easy to think uh, of them as enemies. Now, what uh, Baptiste Morizot does is to inquire, to spend time with the shepherds, to uh, try to understand how wolves behave. He learned in a way to, to talk to wolves or to to um, scream or whatever with wolves and so forth. So uh, he really tries to understand, and I let you read his book because it's fantastic what he describes and what he does. And the result of this process is a displacement of the front lines. Instead of having wolves and sheep, uh, ecologists and shepherds as enemies uh, on both sides of a front line, um, he uh, makes us aware of the fact that um, species, species like wolves and uh, humans and uh, birds and uh, bees and uh, whatever, uh, they may be enemies on the face of it, but in a way they need each other. They are interdependent. We are interdependent, we humans, with bees, even if sometimes bees uh, sting us and it's painful and we curse them and we don't like it at all. Uh, we need bees because they pollinate our fields. Uh, and whenever we think of species being enemies of each other because they are eaten by each other or they attack each other or they conquer each other's ground and so forth, uh, from the point of view of the ecosystem, they are interdependent, even if they may be enemies uh, at another level. So Baptiste Morizot suggests to uh, look at this situation in displacing the front lines. And he says, uh, we, ecologists and shepherds, when you talk to them, when you bring them to see things a different way, when you bring them to talk to each other, very often, not always, but very often, uh, they can develop a common understanding uh, and face another type of enemies. Uh, what Baptiste Morisot does is not to say, oh, we can uh, pacify all the conflicts, just talk to each other and there is no real conflict, we're all in interdependent and everything is fine, no. There are real issues of conflict and there are attitudes more than people or whatever. There are attitudes that are really destructive and we have to fight against these attitudes that are, that are really destructive. What he, uh, the way he names uh, these attitudes that are destructive, he, say, he says they come from enemies of the weaving, the weaving. And instead of talking about inter interspecies, interdependencies, you can talk about entanglements. This is a word that is now very popular in uh, ecologist um, talk, entanglement. We are entangled with each other within ecosystem. And this entanglement weaves our lives with each other. But there are attitudes that just are enemies of the weaving itself, that destroy the ecosystem as such. And these are real enemies. 
But very often when you think of this, uh, you displace the front lines. It's sort of a, a meta conflict. You still have conflict, but the conflict is not necessarily between ecologists and uh, shepherds. Uh, it's not necessarily between wolves and sheep. It is displaced. So that's uh, the, the first uh, hint that I'm taking from uh, Baptiste Morisot in this diplomacy of interspecies um, interdependencies. Um, let's think twice about the, the idea of eradicating our enemies. Uh, what uh, the ecological awareness that is now uh, unfolding more broadly maybe tells us is that weeds or pests, uh, well, we need them. When we bring pesticides or insecticide or, or herbicide in order to eradicate them, uh, in a way we destroy our own, uh, the environment and we destroy our own capacity to live. So we need to reconfigure conflicts. We need to rethink enemies in order to displace it, to face real enemies, which are enemies of the weaving. Uh, and this leads to an endless diplomacy uh, in interdependence. What Morizo strikes is that there is no end to this diplomacy. There is no way to sign a peace agreement that will be everlasting. It's always to be renegotiated at sort of a, this diplomacy uh, attitude. So that was the first, uh, the first point. Second point, uh, what I would call a tactics of coalition. And this uh, starts, uh, addresses this issue of what is an enemy uh, from a different perspective. What strikes me, and as, um, <clears throat> as Francois said, I'm, I'm in France now, I've been living in France for about 20 years. I try to observe a French political life, but I'm not really part of it. And what strikes me, and actually strike me even when I was in the US, is the, the sort of the propensity of leftist movement to consider each other as enemies. The, the closer you are in terms of how you wanna change society, but there's always one small difference about gender, about race, about radicalism, about means of action and so forth. And you end up thinking that your worst enemy is the guy who thinks the same thing as you do for 90% of the issues and just you have this one disagreement. But the Trotskys, Mayoites, whatever, this whole tradition of the left uh, just attacking uh, itself uh, uh, instead of fa facing uh, real, uh, what I think is a more uh, true enemy. So we need coalitions. Now, how do we build these coalitions? And this is where um, Erin Manning thinking about the minor gesture is important. Erin Manning and her um, companion, Brian Masumi, have been very much influenced by Deleuze, Deleuze and, and Guattari's uh, philosophy. And one of the key concepts they take out of Deleuze and Guattari is the notion of the minor, the major and the minor. And uh, what I think they make, they help us understand is uh, a twofold necessity in these tactics of coalition. First, we need to build majoritarian forces. We need, now you're in the US, you are uh, in the process of voting, of a campaign that tries to push people to vote and uh, we need to have more than 50% who vote against the guy who is in the White House now. So we need to build a majoritarian uh, movement and force. Okay, good. And if we are always divided among ourselves, that's not gonna help. Okay, this is clear. But um, how do we do that? Or how do we do that without falling into the same traps that we have done in the past maybe? And I would uh, add, yes, we need to build a majoritarian force, but we need to build it by caring for the minor, by caring for the minor, for minorities. And the minor is not exactly the same thing as minorities. The major in Deleuze and Guattari is what is the norm, the, the dominating norm, and the minor is what is a part, what is marginal towards this norm. It's not necessarily linked to uh, statistics. Uh, the case in mind I have is uh, in, in the north of Brazil, when you go to the city, you see that most people are dark skinned because uh, the majority, statistical majority of the people come from um, Africa. But when you look at the billboards, all the billboards are with uh, European faces. Uh, so even if European people, European origin people are the minority, they are major because there's a standard you aspire to uh, get a work, to get money, to get a lifestyle that is the one of the major. 
even if they're statistically minority. Okay. So what does it mean caring for the minor? Uh, I think it needs to understand that it is in minorities, in the situation of being minor, that is the real strength of political change. Uh, and that being minor, and when I say that, uh, I think in France of Muslim people, uh, you cannot do what most French people do now, which is think in terms of laicity, of laicism, uh, as being against religion. There are no, there are tons of religion, and it's not the same at all to be facing a majoritarian religion, like Catholicism could be in the 19th century in France, or facing a religion but which is a minoritarian religion, a religion of a minority in France, not in Iran, not in Algeria, situation is very different, but in France, uh, Islam is minoritarian. And the way you have to address uh, the, the, the feelings, the way you have to um, understand or respect uh, vulnerabilities or susceptibilities in the minor uh, is very different from the way you have to face a majoritarian force. And I think we are under-equipped in understanding this, and this is one of the main causes that is currently leading, not only in the past between followings of Mao and followings of Trotsky, but uh, also in the present, uh, the left is divided, heavily divided because of this not, um, this insufficient understanding of, um, of what the minor is. Uh, and so this tactics of coalition is also a tactic of care, and in a way, it works better in French because it's a tactique de guerre. Tactique de guerre is the same thing because tactics in war, but tactic, tactics of care, uh, of caring for the minor, the strength and the weaknesses of the minor. So that would be uh, the second point. Now, my third point is what I, I suggested to call a wizardry of virality. And this, again, it's uh, one of the things we talk about uh, a lot, I guess, in the US as in France, uh, what is a virus? And a virus, when we uh, first think of it nowadays, we think of biological viruses, COVID-19. Okay, so, uh, now, what a number of philosophers and uh, analysts and, uh, and uh, thinkers and uh, literary people also, and I will name uh, names like uh, Thierry Bardini. I don't know if you're familiar with Thierry Bardini, he's a French, uh, specialist of arch media archaeology, who now teaches at the University of Montréal, um, but also one of your further guests, uh, I think, I don't think if he already uh, gave his talk in, his, uh, in this series, but Pierre Cassounoguès, who's my colleague at Paris 8, Pierre Cassounoguès just published a book called Virus Land, which is fantastic. Uh, so Thierry Bardini, Pierre Cassounoguès, uh, Frédéric Bisson, a friend of mine from, uh, from Multitude, they all published books recently about the multi-layers of viruses. When we think about viruses, yes, we have biology and COVID, but we also have software viruses. We all know that, or, or computers can be infected by uh, viruses, software viruses that are, are um, uh, injected in the computer and then do various forms of destructions like ransomware, we're very famous uh, a few months ago. Uh, so second layer is the virus as something uh, digital or something uh, having to do with software. But there's also a third layer uh, in virality, which is going viral on the internet. Uh, obviously, Francois and the Maison Francaise and myself are hoping that this video, when it's on YouTube, it will become viral, that uh, dozens and hundreds and thousands and millions of people will see my inflamed talk and will be uh, changed forever and that the fate of the world will be uh, uh, redirected by uh, my enthusiasm now because it will go viral. Uh, we'll see whether it does or whether it doesn't, but that's what we all dream of. So we have these three layers of virality, which are quite contradictory because obviously we're all afraid of COVID. We don't want this type of virus. Uh, obviously we all, well, I don't know, I, I assume it seems like most of us want to go viral, whether in the books we have or in the videos we do, et cetera, et cetera. Now this ambivalence of virality, if you think of it, it is everywhere, even biological viruses. None of us want to be infected with COVID, but we have tons, tons, but millions, I guess, of viruses in our guts. 
our body is functioning because of the viruses that, have, uh, that are currently working in, inside of our body, in our guts, that have been sort of domesticated, made harmless, and so forth. And now, just like I was saying for the wolves, the wolves and the sheep, the ecologists and the shepherds, uh, they are enemies on the face of it, but within interspecies interdependencies, uh, they need each other and they need the tensions of their enmity. Same thing with viruses. We need viruses. In a way, we build antibodies against these viruses and we can coexist with them. We can cohabit uh, with them. Uh, same thing maybe for, uh, for the, the, we all want to go viral, but we all denounce fake news. So this ambivalence of being at the same time something that can be fantastic and at the same time something that's very scary, I think it's constitutive of the, of the viruses. Now, so this domain, this multi-layered domain of uh, virality, I think I, I want, I could say a, a knowledge of virality, but if I said wizardry, it's because I think we cannot really, we will never be able fully to master virality. Uh, and it's one of the, the crazy things of modernity is to think we could master a number of things in nature or whatever. Let's just accept we can try to protect us, to protect ourselves from different types of virality, but we'll never be able to master it. We have more to be in the situation of a wizard trying to understand how it works, but not trusting really how it works, faking certain things, playing with certain things and so forth, knowing that it is stronger than us and uh, try to find some form of, of wizardry to, uh, to address these virality issues. And I will, follow, I will conclude on this. The main displacement, I think, that we need to do when we think about virality is to move from thinking in terms of enmity, enemies. And maybe you didn't see that so much in the US, but in France, when President Macron made his speeches, his first speeches about uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown and so forth, he used very much the rhetoric of war. We are at war, I think, six times or so in this first speech. We are at war against the virus and so forth. Uh, I think the challenge of this wizardry of virality is to understand that uh, uh, hostility, the figure of the enemy, is not appropriate. It's not, it, it's tempting to think because, yeah, this, this is a saloperie, this, uh, this virus. It may kill people we really like and so forth. So it is something terrible and we would like to eradicate it. Uh, but uh, in terms of, instead of just pure hostility and the model of war, I think we should move towards the, the notion of hospitality. Uh, and in French, you know, I was talking about ambivalence. You may know that in the French language, there's a very weird uh, term, which is haute, an haute, H-O-T-E, which can mean both a host and a guest, which is really weird because usually we need to differentiate things. Uh, if you're the object or the subject of an action, uh, do you welcome somebody or are you welcomed by somebody? We want two words for that. Well, in French, there's this weird thing that it's the same word. Ode is both uh, host and guest. And I think it tells us something about this ambivalence also that I found in, uh, in virality. Uh, now, what do viruses do? Whether they do it for a good purpose, to, uh, as far as we're concerned, or for a bad purpose, as far as we're concerned? Well, they infiltrate themselves in place. They're being hosted by places and they try to cohabit with these, uh, with these places. And if a virus is totally successful in uh, infecting everything, uh, well, he will die because he will not have a host uh, to uh, allow him to be a guest, which if you think of it, it's pretty much what we're doing with uh, planet Earth. We have been so powerful in killing our enemies, in herbiciding weeds, in insecticiding uh, insects, uh, that uh, we are crushing, we are collapsing under our own conquests. Uh, so we need to find another model of coexistence and going from hostility to hospitality, I think is one way to do it. And this wizardry of virality uh, my friend Frédéric Bisson just published a book on viropolitique, la viropolitique. Uh, it's also to uh, rethink uh, life on earth and to rethink politics in terms of how to coexist with what you may consider as your um, enemy. 
so I'm, I'm concluding this and uh, I think it's time so then we'll have a discussion with, uh, with Francois. And obviously, even if I didn't stress it uh, as much as I could have, you understand that all I've been saying tonight is directly uh, plugged into what's being discussed now in terms of Islamism, in terms of uh, stupid kid, uh, lost kid, uh, killing this poor uh, teacher in a, in a French uh, suburb last, uh, last uh, week. Uh, uh, yes, we can say these are enemies, we're going to eradicate Islam, Islamism, and so forth. Uh, maybe, just like saying we are at war with the virus, this is not the most helpful and the most intelligent way uh, to do it. So thinking of how we can coexist with some aspects in order to prevent, to build antibodies against other aspects that are clearly unacceptable and are clearly destructive and that clearly needs to be uh, fought against because they are enemies of the weaving, as uh, Baptiste Morizo told us. I think that would be uh, the, the conclusion. We need to face the break. We are living a period of raising conflicts. I didn't really have the time to, uh, to expand on that. But when I talk about raising conflicts, for me, um, jihadism it may not be the scariest thing. Uh, we are we have to, to face conflicts within uh, people who are now at peace with each other. When, for instance, we think of uh, should people working for EasyJet or for Ryanair or for Renault, uh, should they go back to work as they used to? Uh, yes, I want them to go back to work. I don't want them to, to be unemployed. I don't want them to have to sell their house and be uh, thrown in the street. And yet, I don't think the fact that Renault the French company now is so proud that they're back in business and they're producing SUVs as they've never produced SUVs before. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but this, this is enemy of the weaving. When you produce SUVs and you uh, throw more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, I think you are an enemy of the weaving of the life of future generation. So how can I deal with that uh, when my neighbor may be working for Renault and I don't want him to be expelled from, from his houses. So this type of conflict, this type of tension, uh, we have to face them, to face the breaks that are in front of us. And these three different um, suggestions that I made of a uh, diplomacy of interspecies uh, interdependencies, of a tactics of coalition, and a wizardry of virality is just some of the ways that I think we could think of in order to address this. Thank you very much, Yves. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, well, we'll have a discussion, but not too long, because uh, I'm sure that there will be very interesting uh, question. There is already one interesting. Uh, but uh, let, me, let me say just that uh, it's, well, I, I really enjoyed, uh, as usual, the way uh, you you involve uh, other thinkers in your own discourse, and uh, there is always a dialogue with uh, with the thinkers. Uh, you you think uh, in collaboration. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what you did in your recent book, uh, like Deleuze and Guattari, uh, Michael Hart and uh, Tony Negri. And that's uh, that's very interesting. And uh, also, uh, as usual, I mean, when I read your book, you know, I, I think that we. I, I feel smarter after, <laughs> smarter, and also with perhaps more confident, we feel more confident uh, uh, in the future. But, well, yes, there is a discourse of hope uh, in spite of uh, the discourses on uh, collapsing and uh, you are, well, both you, you, you recognize that, yes, there is a, bre a break, but uh, you're careful with the uh, catastrophism. Hmm? Uh, so that was your your last book, your recent book. Uh, but let me just ask you a question about the role your your uh, part, your role as an intellectual, because there is a kind of in this willing uh, this will to, to for repairing the break. You were talking about the break, different breaks, and uh, there is a way for you to think of the. The different uh, yes the different ways to, to to repair the break so there is a kind of i would say i don't know if you would agree with that but uh, a kind of voluntarism in your discourse and uh, um, not only finding solution but well thinking of uh, a possibility of uh, yes uh, of a positive uh, future so uh, is it is it 
the role of an intellectual to yes to give hope and to 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 find solution to repair the, the different breaks yeah thank you that's a very hard question for me because uh i i thought and i can't help thinking that uh, writing for instance writing a book or writing an article that's what i do or teaching a class that's what i do has to be something positive uh I wrote one book, uh, which was the second one, uh, as a critique of a literary critique of political economy. And that was a critique of the physiocrats, uh, this uh, school of thinkers in the 18th century, who were the first one who were called the economists. Les economistes, en fait, le terme, les economistes. Uh, it, it was first used for the physiocrats, same time, a little bit before Adam Smith and so forth. And I wrote a book, uh, in a way, blaming them for neoliberalism. Uh, which I had fun doing it, but then I thought it was just stupid. I mean, these physiocrats, they were brilliant people. Uh, when you read them, you understand so many things. And the fact that they would think what they thought at that point, even if Turgot would uh, send the, the, the force to, uh, to uh, basically beat out uh, the, the population who was asking for cheaper price of, of bread. Uh, well, who am I to criticize the physiocrats? Or who am I to criticize current philosophers? Or who am I to? So I decided after that point, I would never criticize anybody. I don't believe in critique. And that's what I share with uh, Laurent de Souter. Laurent de Souter, I think, will come uh, to give a talk in the spring. And I really love his current work. No critique. You don't critique. OK. Uh, now, um, that means that when you say something, you try to say something positive. You try to say what can be done. And that's why I never critique people, but I spend my time quoting other people because I'm just delighted by the number of beautiful books of fantastic thoughts that are constantly generated. Uh, and so I see my, my goal, again, not as a philosopher, you, you said um, inventor of concepts. And um, I, I mean, I would be, I'm very flattered. Thank you for saying that. But I don't see myself as an inventor uh, of concept as much as just a translator of ideas, of words. Um, and therefore, I'm, I'm addressing your question through a, through a detour. Um, there are tons of, no, not solutions, but tons of helpful thinking out there and helpful writing out there. I see my role as uh, helping it circulate. Again, helping it become a little viral in, in, the capa in my small capacity. Uh, and that presupposes that something can be done, that it's not too late. Now, the work on collapsology was very hard for me. And to tell you the truth, uh, reading books about collapsology for six months or for a year, it just gets reading figures after figures, uh, charts after charts. Uh, it just gets on your on your mind, and it really affected me, and it keeps affecting me because I cannot have hope. So that's that's a very uh, difficult thing to say. We have positive things to do. There are fantastic things that are being done. Let's just go in that direction, and yet let's beware of hope. It's um, people who live in New York City, um, Fred Moten and um, Stefano Harney, who I really I discovered very late, but I really admire their work. And part of their work is to say we, as I mean, Fred Moten, as African-American, uh, we are very suspicious of anybody coming with hope. There's one president who had hope uh, as, as his slogan. And uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, that wasn't enough. Uh, and that may have a sort of uh, put us in some, for some sort of, a, of a leniency or of unawareness of what was to be done. So, and facing uh, climate change and collapse of biodiversity, I think hope is very dangerous. I don't like so much the people who bring hope as a, as a banner. Uh, yet things have to be done, things can be done, and we have to change the perspective that tells us there is hope or no hope. And that's what we try to do in the book. Thank you, Eve. Uh, when I was referring to the, your inventions of concepts, I was thinking of the way you you reenact uh, some notion uh, such as gesture, the geste, or attention, and that's really a, a renewal. Uh, but yes, I understand what you say about uh, the, the the concepts. Uh, I have many questions, but there are some uh, from uh, our audience. And I would like to, to, to read them. So the first one is, I guess that's, uh, it's about uh, your notion of uh, 
hospitality, the, 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 the way you, 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 you want to get rid of the notion of enemy and what. So what, that's the question um, from Yanis uh, Tsiligakis. Uh, would, would you have said the same thing when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor with conventional weapons? Would you be a pacifist around World War II times? Or would be only anti-war uh, when the war is not against an enemy you consider an enemy? Great, thank you very much. That's a very good question. And uh, for, I guess, a lot of things that I may have as a question, the first thing I would say is, I don't know. I don't have a satisfactory response to that. I don't know what I would have done in uh, 1939, 1940, 1941, faced with Japan, faced with uh, Germans and so forth. And I don't pretend I know it. I don't pretend I know what would have been or what was the right thing to do. My whole talk was to say, um, and that uh, situates me in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of maybe even generation. Uh, I live in France now, and I think maybe erroneously, but I think we are not in a state of war. Germans are not attacking us, uh, Japanese are not bombing us, etc. Uh, at least not in terms of conventional war, what we call war is uh, armies facing each other with a front line and so forth. Uh, is a drone part of a war? Is what France is doing now in the Sahel or what uh, Americans are doing in Afghanistan or so forth, send drones, kill selectively, kill people uh, remotely? Um, a French, another good French philosopher, Grégoire Chamayou, whom I really admire also, wrote, uh, 10 years ago, this book about drones saying the model of war with drone, it's not war, it's hunting. Uh, so I would say uh, war, when we, talk about war, we have a certain imaginary uh, which correspond to certain situations. So I'm not denying that. I think we are not in such a situation, even if kids, even if it's just not one kid, but several kids come and kill me as a teacher or kill my, my friend as a teacher or kill whatever, uh, to talk about war is misleading us. It's, it's not what's happening. Maybe there will be a war as we, as we understood them, but this is not the case. Plus, what can we do? And that was, I, I think, what I, what I tried to say at the beginning. What can we do to prevent this from happening? Maybe it'll happen, I don't know. And I really don't know what I will do uh, then. Uh, I uh, really try my best not to have to use weapons, not to use weapons, but I don't know what I would do. Uh, now, the whole point today is to prevent being in a situation where you are in a war and you have to uh, either take a gun or, or surrender or welcome uh, the enemy, which for this case might be a real enemy because we would be in a real war. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm dodging the question because uh, I don't wanna talk about war, I want to talk about now where we are in a pre-war state. And I think what we have to do is to avoid getting there. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not such a fact. You want to rephrase the question, Francois? Maybe I didn't understand properly or? No, no, no. I think you, no. you, <laughs> you correctly answered. <laughs> so uh, the second question uh, from uh, Anindita Baslev. Uh, what is the modus operandi for transforming hostility to hospitality? Uh, and I have to say that uh, I'm a bit doubting about you, what you say about hospitality and virus. <laughs> I don't know what it, what it means to yeah. consider the possibility of hospitality for a, a virus. But of course, as you said, well, there is metaphors uh, from the notion of virus. But anyway, and so, but uh, it's the question is referring to a specific uh, topic. So, what is the modus operandi for transforming hostility to hospitality in the context? in the context of Islamist separatists in France today? What's, what are your suggestions? Okay. And thank you very much. Again, that's another uh, very uh, interesting question for which I don't have the proper answer. So I'm gonna try to, to struggle with it as best as I can. And first start by acknowledging uh, the problem of what I'm saying. And there's something you didn't raise, Francois, or maybe it's the further, the further question, but uh, there is something very dubious 
and that can be very heavily criticized in bringing hospitality and hostility together. Because you say, oh, now what we have to do in the situation that we are now with refugees coming from the south of the Mediterranean in, in Europe or with people coming uh, in Mexico to the US and just to put together hospitality and hostility, uh, that's what Trump-like people uh, tend to say. Uh, so uh, um, by bringing these things in coexistence, uh, this is very, very problematic. But I think, again, I'm sorry I'm doing that because uh, I, I don't totally master what can be drawn out of this. And that's what I was thinking more of a wizardry. It's not a mastery. It's not, I don't have the answer. I don't have the solution. But I think we have to face uh, the problem of putting these two things to, together even if it is difficult. Uh, now, on the special case of, uh, of Islam, um, what I find uh, dangerous and counterproductive is to reduce what is happening now. It's not with Islam, it's with Islamism, with radical, certain radical form of uh, Islamism, uh, and to consider it, again, in terms of war. Uh, and we have to, what we hear now every day in France, uh, we shouldn't be afraid or we sh shouldn't just, uh, we shouldn't um, compromise with anything. We should be firm with freedom of expression. We should be firm with all these things. And I think this firmness, I understand why people say that. And they do have good reason to say that. But putting it in, into uh, the context of virality brings us different issues. For instance, uh, what is terrorism? I hate this word terrorism. I think it's, it's just one of these poisoned words that when we use it, we do more harm than uh, good. But okay, I'm using it also. Uh, terrorism lives in order to terrorize people. And today, in order to terrorize people, you need to uh, infect the media and you need to colonize the media. What has been happening now in France for a week is that every day, Every time I, I watch television or I listen to, to the radio, uh, all we talk about is this one action by this crazy, poor, disoriented kid, a uh, criminal kid who killed this poor uh, teacher uh, who tried his best to help kids like him uh, to understand things in a little more, in a more complex fashion, just exactly what I'm trying to do. So I could be this professor, I identify with him, and yet, uh, I think that the production of this kid who killed him is linked to media virality. Uh, this poor kid had, as far as we can understand, uh, just uh, frustration and powerlessness and uh, rage in him. And he knew, because we had repeated that same scene uh, ever and ever again before, that if he would do something as awful as that, that he would be, even if he was dead, that his name, his uh, face, his existence would be the center of French attention for at least a week now and probably longer. And I don't understand how we, we do not put into the equation this uh, just natural hunger for attention. As I said, we all want to go viral. Well, you have one easy way to go viral. Okay, you die, but maybe your life doesn't have such so much value for different reasons. And you can become a virus in the mediarchy, in the circulation of images and affects and information. And this is so tempting uh, to think that you're gonna change the world and whether it's to bring the prophets law on earth, whether it's to for the revolution or whatever, uh, the fact that we don't understand that we tr don't try, I think enough to relocate actions like this within the system of virality of uh, mediarchy. Uh, I think this, this is a blindness in us and talking about viruses to address issues of terrorism. For me, it's one way to say that. Okay, uh, if there are other questions, but may I add something to the, 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 the last question. <clears throat> Speaking of uh, naming, because I understand that, uh, well, you take care of the way uh, one's uh, name, the reality, and well, you're reluctant with the, the notion of terrorism. But 
speaking of naming, saying that this guy, we don't know exactly the, the, the case. We don't know who he, who he is, who he was, but you immediately say, well, he's, may I say just a crazy guy, a disoriented kid, but you don't know. And that's, I'm struck by the fact that uh, from 2005, you know, it's, it's, it's always the, the, the way some uh, leftists considered this, uh, this attack uh, by saying, well, that's solitary wolves and they lose solitaire. And uh, isn't it a, a kind of denial of the, you know, the fact that these people very well okay that's not of course the, the muslims in france but mm. but uh, they embodies uh, an uh, ideology you know and absolutely they're not absolutely. just crazy kids you know absolutely there are yeah. organization there are people taking advantage of them there are people instrumentalizing them and maybe uh, i don't know again i don't know who he was from what i understand i think he was more instrumentalized by uh, people who had a strategy who had an intelligence in both sense of central intelligence agency and an understanding of how to bring disruption in a society so i'm not denying that at all i think and thank you for bringing it because this is very important uh, and that helps me to address your your uh, question earlier uh, I don't think I, I mean, I said hope, I don't really believe in uh, optimism, I don't believe in, but there is something else, which is to uh, have confidence in people. First, I have confidence in people. And I think people, they're not natural born killers. Uh, I don't think that. I think you have to uh, find yourself in a very traumatizing situation or a very frustrating situation or a very enraging situation to do things like that. Yes, people instrumentalize that, just like the people who will be voting for Trump. I don't think they're all uh, fascist and they're all racist and they're all uh, people who should be eradicated from the earth, just like we thought pests or whatever should be eradicated. No, I'm sure most of them are maybe nice people, are people who, again, they have been caught in a situation uh, where they feel frustration and rage and they see a sense of injustice. And for me, this, this notion of injustice, I think is very strong because what is being discussed now in France, it's all in terms of law. The law says that, the law should say that, and one should obey the law and so forth. And one, don't say, uh, one doesn't say enough that yes, laws are very important, but when people are given laws and they see, they feel injustices, uh, in terms of social situation, in terms of for the neo-colonialism, in terms of oppression and so forth, uh, this feeling of injustice is more powerful. So no, I'm not denying that people, whether it's Trump people or whether it's jihadist people, instrumentalize uh, others and that this has to be taken into equation. And again, when I, when I, but Baptiste Morizot said enemies of the weaving, we have to fight against enemies of the weaving. And I see jihadists as I see uh, Trump like uh, politics as enemies of the weaving, and we have to fight them. So, what's the difference between uh, explanation and uh, justification or yeah. excuse? Yeah, thank you. That's, I can't, you, you, you find me in the, in the weak spot. So, I can't, uh, I can't really understand. Uh, respond uh, satisfactorily to it. Uh, there's, for those who may be further away from France, there was this prime minister, Manuel Valls, uh, who famously said a few years ago, oh, to, uh, to understand, again, things like terrorism, or it's already to justify or to find excuses. Uh, and um, so I'm, I don't particularly like Manuel Valls, and I strongly disagree with uh, him saying that. And yet, it is uh, something difficult for me because as you nicely said earlier, I worked on Spinoza. I, I wrote a book on Spinozism. And for me, one of the, the most difficult, most demanding, most challenging, but also most interesting part of Spinoza uh, is to say um, understanding, which is finding causes that help explain an effect finding the causes that help explain why this kid uh, killed that uh, my, my fellow teachers. Uh, well, we can find reasons. Uh, reasons might be 
uh, jihadist organization that lured him into doing that. That is an ideology, all the things you said, that might be frustration, that might be uh, structures in the French society, structures of injustice, that might be what's happening in Palestine with Israel. All these things are causes. And when you uh, try to understand the causes that pushed even something as horrendous as what happened last week, uh, well, it's 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 you 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 don't feel like judging, or you 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 are you think it's it's thing that should be prevented, that cannot be condoned, that cannot be accepted, and yet you don't feel like you can judge in moral terms to say uh, I'm better than you and uh, whatever. So this this moment of judging. Uh, you have to try to prevent yourself from poison. You have to try to neutralize things that are poisonous. Uh, but the attitude of judging for the way I understand Spinoza is something you're not comfortable with. <laughs> okay, uh, another question from uh, William Eaton uh, in French. À Paris 8, le professeur Lyotard <laughs> m'a appris <laughs> que le siècle des Lumières était terminé. Marx m'a appris que les forces économiques impersonnelles dominent. Les intellectuels sont des apologistes, des propagandistes, etc. Alors, quelle est ma question Le capitalisme. Je ne sais pas. Ok, je... great. Oh, I love that. Thank you very much. Uh, um, well, uh, I mean, that would take just uh, the last, last half an hour just to address all these things about le siècle des lumières, Marx and capitalism. Uh, The, the, the book I've been working on this summer, it's called Alter Modernity, and it's precisely on rereading the Enlightenment in a different way in order to uh, stop, again, judging or categorizing as a strict bina binarity, the moderns, the philosophes for freedom of expression and so forth, and the anti-moderns or the, the, again, the Christians, the people, the, the devots and all that. And to think of alter modernity is to say that there was a whole range, a whole range of writers who uh, were neither one nor the other. And that these are the, probably the more interesting things in the Enlightenment. So I think we need to do a different reading of the Enlightenment uh, uh, with this concept of alter modernity. Now, Marx and capitalism. Uh, and I think this is quite interesting that now this whole debate now about what's happening in France in the last week, uh, The Enlightenment is very much often brought to say, oh, freedom of expression, it's Voltaire, the caricature, it's Voltaire again, and so forth, écrasons l'infâme. So the, the affiliation with that is very strong. The reference to Marx is much less common. Actually, to tell you the truth, in a week, I haven't heard anybody bring Marx into the picture or bring capitalism in the picture. Again, as if these were totally different things. And what I was saying earlier that we need to understand an action like this within a broader context. I put the action within the broader context of the media to answer about virality, but I think it needs to be put in the broader context also of a certain development of capitalism, of extractivism, of neoliberalism, which has as its consequence uh, to uh, increase inequalities to increase the feeling of injustice, of social injustice. And I think Marx is very much a part of the picture. Now we tend to think in terms of colonial, neo-colonial, post-colonial, decolonial, because these are population of Arab origin and uh, the conflict in France with the, the continuation of the colonization. And I think it's this cannot be reduced to just capitalism, but it has to be understand this colonial or neo-colonial forms of domination has to be understood within the context also of uh, neoliberalism. And the fact that it happens also linked with schools and that France, I think, is still in a much better situation with schools than the United States of America. The funding of schools in France uh, is much more equalitarian than it is in the United States of America. So in a way, this is uh, the, the neoliberal uh, sort of defunding of public institution has been less damaging in France than in the US, and that's important. Yet, uh, it has had some effects and we clearly underfund uh, our public schools. Uh, and again, I don't think things are so easy that, oh, if we had, had proper uh, budget for schools, there would be no problem with terrorism. No, things are not, unfortunately, they're not that simple. 
But I think that the whole situation that brings a, a strong sense of injustice and defiance towards the laws of the French Republic, I think it has been fed uh, by capitalism and its development over the last 40 years. Yes. Okay, thank you, Yves. But, um... Are you ready for a Derridean question? <laughs> oh my God, I'm weak on Derrida. Go ahead, go ahead. I just, I just show okay. that I'm not so fond of Derrida, that's okay. <laughs> From uh, anonymous, an uh, anonymous attendee. I find myself, I find myself, myself thinking about along a different Derridean line from that, uh, but of the specter. That's about the specter. The specter what is so, this one I've read, what, yeah. yeah. What, is, what is so striking about the virus from which you started is that it is, listen, uh, it is neither alive nor dead, oh, but yeah. undead. Cool. A kind of zombie or specter. Does, okay. does, this, makes the, does this make for a too pessimistic approach to ecology and the dead teacher? Cool, thank you. I never liked the reader as much as, as with this question. Um, um, yes, uh, I mean, I am not at all a specialist in virus. I don't know anything about viruses, except what I read in Thierry Bardini. Again, I really refer you to Thierry Bardini. He wrote a good article in AOC. I don't know if you read this uh, French uh, online uh, journal daily called AOC. Uh, there's a very good article by Thierry Bardini uh, where he develops that. He wrote also another article you can find online called Vade Mecum. Uh, no, Vade Retrovirus, Vade Retrovirus, pardon, Vade Retrovirus, Thierry Bardini and your friend. And what he tells us in this article is that it is very difficult for us with our human bodies and our ideas of individuation to understand what a virus really is. For instance, it is very difficult to decide whether it's alive or dead, exactly what you said, or undead. Uh, it is alive at certain moments, and in a way, it, when it's in a body, it, then it sort of br brings this sort of cover around itself. Uh, and it goes into another phase. And you can say, well, maybe it's dead. It's just code. It's just a bit of code. And a bit of code is not alive. Uh, and then it becomes, so whether it's alive or not, or, or very binary categories of live or dead uh, doesn't really work for that because it goes away. Same thing with, is it one thing? We talk about the virus or a virus. But again, people who look at it in more details than I did myself tell us, oh, virus exists in populations. You were talking about MERT earlier, Francois, for, uh, for when Derrida, um, Deleuze and Guattari wrote their book. There were two people, but there were so many people inside of them that they were uh, a MERT, uh, herd, or what is it? What is it, a MERT? Herd, I guess. Herd, okay, okay. Uh, so uh, virus are herds. They're, they're not, one virus doesn't mean anything. Uh, so these, uh, and in a way, bringing uh, Derrida for, for this to make us more wary of the simplifications that we assume when we talk about viruses in terms of biology. But same thing for the other types of virality I was thinking of. Uh, again, is it one thing? Is it an individual? Is it a population? Uh, is it alive or dead or both at the same time? I think we have to, to keep these questions uh, open in order to understand the potentials of uh, virality and that these potentials so far we have uh, them turned against us in terms of uh, our body or in terms of our computers being infected by viruses mm -hmm. but uh, we could maybe turn it to our advantage uh, if we uh, knew if we had this wizardry in order to, to uh, try to approach them differently. Thank you, Yves. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you a, a more general question about the intellectual debate, uh, especially regarding the relationship uh, between uh, uh, France and uh, or Europe uh, and the US. I said that you're, you're an uh, amazing reader and you, you read everything. And so what, what are your, your opinion about the, this uh, dialogue or the, this, uh, yes, this, this perhaps misunderstanding between uh, France and, uh, and the US, uh, not only regarding uh, the question of uh, free speech or liberté d'expression, but also uh, regarding, uh, the, the, regarding the philosophical uh, debate today. Uh, 
You know, well, well not, a, not a long time ago, uh, the uh, French philosophy inspired, has inspired uh, the, the United States through the French theory. But uh, it's, it looks like uh, now it's the contrary. Hmm? Mm -hmm. That's no, very interesting. Because, uh, well, you, when you see the, well, the gender, the queer studies, post-colonial, the care. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's back now to, to Europe from, from the United States. Could you, could you say, and media, because you work on media studies too, you know mm. that also sound studies, you know, and so that's, it comes from the, the United States uh, at the opposite of the, the 70s, uh, the, the 80s. Uh, so what's your, uh, your view uh, from a European perspective? I don't know, because you're on, yeah. you're on both sides by your readings. Yeah, by my readings, because again, in my personal history, I lived in the US from 1992 until 2003, more or less. Uh, so I was very familiar with what's, what was happening there in terms of social life and intellectual life in a way, although I was discovering it. Um, and then I came to France and I, I used to go back every once in a while to the US, but I'm not very up to date to what's being discussed on campuses and so forth. So I, it comes to me through books or through some articles. And I think there's a delay, so I don't pretend I understand what is the, the state of theory now in the US. Nevertheless, my personal um, trajectory is that uh, I read French theory uh, before even I went to the US and I was enthralled in that. And I was in a way in familiar ground when people like Negri and Hart would, uh, would develop their, their thinking. And there was Guattari and there was a lot of things behind that or Italian autonomy and so forth. So clearly there was a movement from Europe to the US at that point, whether it's French or Italian. Whatever. Uh, and the way I feel is that when I went uh, to the US in the 90s, I discovered a lot of things uh, that I had never talked about or that had never been talked about when I was in the universities or in the system in, in Switzerland. Again, I wasn't in France, but still. Uh, and for instance, I discovered a Swiss woman writer from, uh, well, she was Dutch, but whatever, somebody who wrote in the 18th century, Isabelle de Charrière. To me, she's just as important as Rousseau, as Montesquieu, as uh, uh, Marivaux in the 18th century. She lived, uh, I don't know, 100 kilometers from Geneva. And I had never heard of her until I went to the US. And the MLA did a small publication of Les Lettres de Mistress Henley, de Isabelle de Charrière. And I discovered that. And it's not so simple because I discovered that Jean Starobinsky had written, who was my teacher in Geneva, he had written an article also a, a little bit before, but that nobody talked about her in French 18th century studies. So even in French literature, I discovered author, usually female author, and that's not uh, maybe uh, by chance uh, in the US. And since then, I considered my job, in particular with a book called Mediarchy, who uh, ironically has been retranslated into English. So for me, that was really uh, interesting because the book is, mostly to import into French discourse about media. In France, we have the, the mediologue, the, la mediologie, whom I really like, Daniel Bouniou and so forth, they did fantastic job, but they were very much closed to the outside of France. And I saw my job as bringing things from Germany, which hadn't been really important, Hitler and so forth, Wilhelm Flusser, uh, but also mostly from the United States and mostly from New York City, Alexander Galloway, Mackenzie Wark, et cetera. I guess your, your colleagues uh, around the, the New York City uh, theory scene. These things seem to me so important. And the fact that we would not uh, hear about them in, uh, in France, in, in theory, except in very small circles of people working on digital studies and so forth. So, I very much saw it as importing to France uh, thought that were developed in the US, that were developed in the US because they had been fed by Deleuze, Derrida, Guattari, Lyotard, and all these things, and were developing something very original that then uh, I think are necessary in France. And part of my job, as you said, I, I don't read so many things, but the few things I read, I talk about, that's what it gives you the illusion that I read so many things. And part of it is just to, to, re, to bring in France these things that to me are very helpful to understand our situation. 
Yeah. Uh, could you say something about the, the intellectual uh, debate in uh, in France? Uh, as you know well, the the, the journal uh, Le Débat, you know, uh, has uh, ended. Well, I know that's uh, well, that's not your uh, <laughs> political side. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, Pierre Nora said, uh, and um, uh, Gaucher also said, well. That's not the end, uh, just of uh, ju just the end of uh, a journal, but that's the end of the intellectual. What is the kind of uh, legend? <laughs> this intellectual, the French intellectual uh, debate. But we could also say that uh, the l'état moderne also uh, collapsed, <laughs> and so that's not only this. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say. Uh, this uh, right, uh, because that's not exactly a right-wing uh, journal, but anyway, that's that's a general problem because also, as you know, uh, some uh, editions, you know, uh, especially uh, uh, <coughs> editors, uh, editors of uh, for political science and philosophy and uh, well, also, uh, you know, uh, failed, collapsed. And so could you say something about the, because you you are still uh, the, the co-editor of this uh, this uh, very inspiring uh, uh, journal uh, multitude so could you say some something about the the, the current uh, uh, intellectual debate uh, in France <clears throat> thank you yeah uh, well I was I was sad to see Le temps moderne and le débat go Le temps moderne Patrice Manillier is doing a whole seminar now in the in Artec in this thing that I'm, I'm working with about what would be les temps modernes for the 21st century? And I think that's a very uh, interesting question. And that presupposes that something needs to be done for the 21st century. That would be a continuation of maybe a metamorphosis of the temps moderne. So I think this is a, quite a, a, I mean, a, an important endeavor. For le débat also, le débat, I'm, uh, this is the, uh, I mean, I, I don't think so many people talk about my work, but le débat did very early on when I did this book on, uh, on uh, Les Etudes Littéraires and called me Stalinist, which I thought was fantastic because I don't, I don't see what can be Stalinist in what I do. I'm thinking I'm, I'm reproaching myself not to be Stalinist enough, but I was very happy that the débat would call me a Stalinist. So just for that, I'm really sad that they're, they're going because I think you need uh, a diversity of voices. Um, now, I'm even more sad uh, to see Vacarme go because Vacarme to me was one of the very uh, stimulating uh, journal uh, in France uh, over the recent years. And they went all, I mean, they, they, they stopped also their publications for interesting reason. I, I don't know, I guess we don't have time to go into that. And so with Multitude, we sort of uh, survived. We started in the year 2000. Uh, very much with the Negri and Hart or the alter mondialism and all that. And I think against all odds, we're still alive. But uh, I think each time that it's going to be the last, the last issue, but we're continuing. And uh, in a way, uh, I feel very much of a past generation because I, the, the way I sense things uh, now in the intellectual life is that um, journal like Multitude, some people say they read us and they few people because we don't really have a, a strong impact, but in art schools or whatever, sometimes, oh yeah, multi teacher, I read a few things like that. Uh, um, and I feel our, our very mode of thinking or mode of publishing uh, articles, sort of difficult articles to read, fairly long articles, etc. I think it will always live on. So I'm, I don't, I'm not, I don't think we're, we're from the past, but I think that uh, it's, it takes place now in a sort of a media environment that makes it very much more difficult to identify. So I heard also uh, Gaucher and company sort of lamenting uh, the state yeah. of, of edition now. And I, I learned things by listening to them because they said, for instance, that I think Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie or this type of, of intellectuals uh, in, the, in the 70s, 80s, they would sell 60,000 issues, 60,000 copies of their book about French history or the book of social sciences. So just now, I mean, to sell 1,000 is fantastic, to sell 3,000 is unheard of. And so the, just the, the, the contrast between 60,000 copies and 1,000, it is striking. And it's not from two centuries ago, it's just a few decades. So I understand their frustration. I understand that they think, oh, the world has changed so drastically, where are we? Um, Yet I, I sense, 
again, from the very small number of people I uh, fray with in the university and so forth, uh, that there is a desire for the type of thing that either le débat, to me, that it's not a matter of ideology, just the type of writing, the type of addressing question of writing articles that are not just specialized for, a, for an academic journal on this or that, but sort of these generalistic journals. I think there's a need for that. I think there's not a big audience, but my hope is that uh, it will um, find more relays to uh, contribute to the debate. And I think what's missing, if you ask me to, 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 to say what's missing now in the French intellectual ecosystem, if you want, is, uh, sorry, Francois, but people like you, uh, the type of job you were doing when you were at France Culture or the type of job that other people are doing at France Culture, France Inter or other. Uh, this is something that's very important is people, uh, intellectuals themselves, writers, uh, university people who are welcomed in uh, media with a wide audience and who do their job, who do their job of being thinkers, of helping us think, of welcoming people to present their books, to present, to discuss ideas. And this is, this is very much missing, I think, in, uh, in, especially in the, in the even public media, because you do have agreement between La Croix and France Culture or some big journal, Nouvel Observateur, whatever. But I think there should be really a, a mediation that would be work as a relay for uh, journals, not just Multitude because it's mine, but for this type of, of journals to uh, help them access a wider audience. And I think uh, Nora or Gaucher Lament is both uh, sort of, uh, they're, they're old and uh, too bad for them. Both they have, they have a real issue and I think it can be mended. Something can be done. It just times pass and times change. Something should be done in this relay, in this mediation in the media. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that social media will take place of uh, this classical, uh, classical journal? I don't know because I'm writing books about media, but I've never been uh, on social media. So I just look at it uh, as for to me, it's as strange as Telegraph was in the 19th century. I studied, I read a lot of books about Telegraph and it's fascinating to see how that worked. Uh, and social media is the same. I, I never wanted or just don't have time. It's not that I despise it. I just don't know how I would find the time to be part of this. So I'm not on it. And so I, I don't pretend I understand and I know how, how that works or what effect it, it has. Okay, so Eve, thank you very much. And uh, we were waiting for your next book uh, forthcoming uh, this year or thank next you. year? I don't know what I've been presenting today. Maybe it'll come out early uh, March or April uh, next uh, in 2021. Maybe never, I don't know, so. <laughs> Let us know, please. Thank you very much thank for the invitation. Much. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Maison Française. And thank you, NYU. Hope to see you here in, uh, at NYU. Thanks. Thanks, Francois. Bye. Bye.